Author's Prefaces for Agamemnon. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Agamemnon by Aeschylus. Translated by Edmund Doidge Anderson Moorshead, 1849-1912. to Author's Prefaces first preface aeschylus son of euphorion an athenian of the deme of eleusis was born b c five twenty five he consecrated his life to the tragic art from his youth upwards yet he is held to have been a valiant soldier and with his brother kinegirus to have fought at marathon and at salamis and at plataea as some say afterwards being at variance with the athenians he went away from them unto sicily and dwelt at the court of hiero tyrant of gela and was held by him in high honour he died in his sixty-ninth year by a strange fate whereof he had been warned in an oracle saying a stroke from heaven shall slay thee for as he was walking on the shore an eagle that had snatched up a tortoise into the air let it drop and it fell upon him and he died such is almost all that we are told and more than we can be said to know certainly of the life of the poet whose masterpiece i have done my best to render into english verse with the hope of helping one or two of those to whom the original is a closed book to share in its treasures the remaining fragments of tradition the cause of his quarrel with his countrymen the statement that he divulged the sacred mysteries remain not now to be verified of those given above the tale of his death has been preserved for its striking singularity it has the authority of story and no more to his familiarity with war by land and sea his surviving dramas bear the strongest witness there is a priori likelihood and intrinsic evidence and some external testimony of his having shared in one or more of the great battles which saved the western world nor does his departure from athens to whatever cause it was due nor his residence apparently on two separate occasions in sicily admit of doubt a vague statement that his poetry was inspired by wine a portraiture of him by the pen of aristophanes in the frogs intended as i am convinced those of euripides and socrates by the same hand were intended mainly as a literary portrait of the author and teacher not a delineation of the man as he was some notices from aristotle of the improvements introduced by him into the arrangements of the dramatic stage these and a few others form the whole of our scanty information respecting the life of aeschylus son of euphorion stat magni nominis umbra of his works there remain to us seven dramas only out of a very large number fragments or notices bring up the total to seventy-eight plays of which the titles are known if we can judge of those we have not in any degree by those which we have and many of the fragments lead us towards such an estimate the chaos of lost things holds no equal treasure but it is not now to be rescued in his own words in distois pelithontos utis alca perhaps a list of the surviving dramas may be useful to those wishing to form an idea of the poet's scope and range these plays in the chronological order that seems most probable are one the suppliant maidens the scene is laid at argos two the prometheus bound the scene is on a scythian peak looking down from afar upon the euxine three the persians scene the tomb of darius at susa the treasure city of the king of persia four the seven against thebes scene the city of thebes in boeotia five the agamemnon six the libation bearers and seven the furies of these three last plays which form a consecutive whole called a trilogy and yet are individually complete the scene is argos or mycenae note argos and mycenae are in reality about six miles apart in the great coilon argos wide valley of argolis the relics of the dynasty of atreus are undoubtedly at mycenae aeschylus however calls the scene always argos not caring to particularize about a district so well known 
the fact that he describes the beacon fire on mount arachne as visible to the palace need not lead us to conclude that he had argos more in mind than mycenae though the mountain is visible if i remember right from larissa the citadel of argos and not i am sure from the acropolis of mycenae the beacon glare would have been clearly seen from either no doubt but aeschylus ignores such detail as mr clark peloponnesus page seventy remarks every athenian saw daily from his own hills the peak of arachne to the south and knew it looked upon the region of argos and this was enough for the poet afterwards the temple of apollo at delphi lastly the acropolis and areopagus at athens of an athenian trilogy that is a combination of three dramas by the same hand whether on the same or different subjects for consecutive presentment on the same day and followed by a lighter play called a satiric drama there remains to us this solitary specimen of the satiric drama the cyclops of euripides familiar to english readers by shelley's translation it may be added to explain the apparent difficulty of listening continuously to three dramas each in itself a perfect whole that in the first place a whole day of leisure and not the last few hours between work or play and sleep of an exhausted audience was devoted to the theatre and secondly that the whole length of the three plays combined which form this trilogy is rather less than that of hamlet i do not say that they would not necessarily take longer to act than hamlet but merely that the intellectual strain to an appreciative audience would not necessarily be greater change of interest not mere rest is the essential relaxation of the mind and this which shakespeare provides for example by the soliloquies of hamlet the greek dramatists and pre-eminently aeschylus provided by the choric odes or chants inserted between the several episodes of the play of such odes this trilogy and especially the agamemnon presents to us the noblest surviving specimens they may be regarded as the poet's profoundest musings on the moral and religious and historical problems suggested by the mythical tale which forms the groundwork of his drama of the grandeur the preternatural effect of these musings while the imminent doom is preparing no words of explanation or translation can give an adequate account if it is lawful to adopt words written for a very different purpose by a poet in whom survives more of the spirit of aeschylus than in any other modern one might say of these choric odes they are as a pause a breathing space a curtain behind which god the great scene-shifter prepares the last and supreme act of the mighty drama listen how in the deep shadow behind a dull and heavy sound is waxing listen what footstep is that which passes to and fro look how the curtain sways and waves and trembles before the breath of that which is behind note victor hugo napoleon le petit last chapter End note of the mythical tale well known as it is which forms the groundwork of this trilogy some slight sketch may be useful atreus and thyestes sons of pelops fled from their father and dwelt at argos with eurystheus the king thereof and when he died atreus ruled in his place and wedded his daughter but thyestes wronged his brother's wife and was banished from argos and after a while he returned again and clung unto the altar at argos and atreus fearing to slay him devised this deed he slew certain of the children of thyestes and bade him to a banquet and gave him to eat of his own children's flesh and he ate knowing not what it was but when he knew what was done he spake a bitter curse upon the house of atreus that they should all perish by a doom like that of his own children and there befell these woes unto that house that for three generations the curse of murder departed not away for the children of atreus agamemnon and menelaus wedded the daughters of leda clytemnestra and helen and afterwards paris the son of priam being the guest of menelaus did bear away helen his queen unto troy and agamemnon and menelaus went forth to vengeance against paris and troy but artemis was wroth with the brothers and forbade their ships to sail and they lay at aulis many days then calchas the prophet proclaimed that they should not go forth 
unless agamemnon should offer up his daughter iphigenia in sacrifice unto artemis and the king was unwilling so to do yet for his oath's sake and for his brother and the captains of the fleet he consented and offered up his daughter and the fleet sailed and they besieged troy for nine years and in the tenth year it fell but clytemnestra the wife of agamemnon was wroth because of her daughter's death and she did evil with aegisthus the youngest son of thyestes and they plotted to murder agamemnon when he should return and sent away his son orestes unto strophius king of phocis that he might not know what they did and when agamemnon came back from troy clytemnestra received him gladly and led him into the palace and as he was bathing himself she flung over him a net and smote him and he died and clytemnestra and aegisthus ruled in argos but orestes heard of his father's wrongful death and went unto the oracle of delphi to inquire thereof and apollo bade him avenge his father and not spare his own mother but slay her and secretly he came to argos bearing feigned news of his own death in phocis and so came into the palace of his father again and slew his mother clytemnestra and aegisthus then was he distraught and maddened by the furies in revenge for clytemnestra's slaying and he wandered over the earth seeking purification for his deed but the furies followed him at last he came to the temple of delphi and clung to the altar and the god cast a deep sleep over the furies and bade him fly to athens where he should find safety but the ghost of clytemnestra arose from the shades and awoke the furies and they followed him and were wroth with apollo and they held dispute on the acropolis and athena bade certain of the men of athens decide the cause with her and in the end they proclaimed the deed of orestes to have been rightly done and the guilt of matricide to have been wiped away then the furies were angered with athena in her land but athena promised them great honour from the athenians and a sacred dwelling place in the land even a cave beneath areopagus and they were appeased and were called no more furies but gracious goddesses and orestes went back unto his father's kingdom and the curse of blood upon the house of atreus was stayed Note i have ventured to give to the whole trilogy the title of the house of atreus as the name most applicable to all three parts the older name oresteia seems to me to have meant in aristophanes the libation bearers only it is hardly applicable to the agamemnon it will be obvious even from a compendium like the foregoing that the myth is an epic in itself and regarding aeschylus's treatment of it as a whole we may discern a special propriety in the poet's recorded saying that his dramas were scraps from the lordly feast of homer i have sometimes fancied that an interesting parallel might be drawn between the three parts of the trilogy and the three divisions of the divine comedy for we have in both the same central idea the succession that is of guilt atonement absolution dante fixes his epic in the future world aeschylus in the present but mutatis mutandis substituting the deepest religious thought of athens for that of the middle ages the most shadowy and gigantic vision of retributory forces for the clearest and most distinct we shall find the parallel curiously suggestive to say the least of the essential unity of moral speculation the first part of the trilogy the drama agamemnon takes up the above myth at the point where agamemnon's return from troy is being anxiously awaited at argos in the tenth year of the war the first choric ode recalls some of the previous history dwelling particularly on the circumstances of the sacrifice of iphigenia then follows the appearance of the herald and of agamemnon the treacherous welcome of clytemnestra the prophecy of cassandra daughter of priam now a captive in agamemnon's train the murder of the king and clytemnestra's savage exultation over his body and that of cassandra with the appearance of aegisthus and his avowal of his plot and motives the drama closes leaving clytemnestra and her paramour in supreme power over argos the second part called the kiphoroi or libation bearers from the duty imposed upon the chorus of pouring libations on agamemnon's tomb opens with the secret return of orestes the mutual recognition of himself and his sister electra 
and their invocation of the sleepless spirit of their father to aid their planned revenge then orestes assuming the character of a phocian stranger recounts to clytemnestra a feigned tale of his own death in that land then received into the palace he slays aegisthus and clytemnestra and avows his commission from apollo to the deed but already his are but wild and whirling words and maddened by the guilt of blood he sees the furies arise with dark robes and snaky hair and calling on apollo for protection he flees wildly away Note two scenes of the trilogy have been thus admirably sketched by mr browning in pauline old lore loved for itself and all it shows the king treading the purple calmly to his death while round him like the clouds of eve all dusk the giant shades of fate silently flitting pile the dim outline of the coming doom and the boy with his white breast and brow and clustering curls streaked with his mother's blood and striving hard to tell his story ere his reason goes End note. the third part called the furies the greek name eumenides signifying literally the gracious goddesses from the change in the nature of the furies with which the drama closes opens at delphi in the temple of apollo the furies lie in sleep made drowsy by the god orestes clings to the altar apollo bids him be of good hope and depart unto athens while the furies are yet asleep as he passes from the stage the ghost of clytemnestra rises and calls the slumbering furies to arise and pursue the criminal then apollo himself with words of loathing bids them forth from his temple and scenting like hounds the track of blood they follow the flying orestes here the scene shifts to athens orestes having followed the behest of apollo clings to the statue of athena on the acropolis and claims her aid the cause is tried apparently on areopagus the scene probably representing both the acropolis and the adjacent areopagus athena presiding apollo pleading orestes part the furies impeaching him of matricide the votes are cast and found equal for acquittal and condemnation and this result as athena has previously ruled gives orestes the benefit of the doubt the furies wroth at being thus defrauded of their victim vow vengeance on athena's land and nation but she appeases them by promising them honourable worship for ever as gracious and fostering powers of earth from her own athenians and so solemnly escorted by torches and processions they pass down into their subterranean cave beneath areopagus with words of blessing upon attica and the third and last part of the trilogy closes with joy and with extinction of the curse it will appear by a glance at this plot that the agamemnon and the libation bearers are both of them tragedies in the accepted modern sense the one closing with the death of agamemnon and the triumph of murder and adultery the other with the death of clytemnestra and with madness as the reward of matricide the furies might seem to modern eyes less a tragedy than a drama of restoration yet it conforms in all respects to the aristotelian definition of tragedy the situation is undeniably tragic though the conclusion dispels the gloom the trilogy is aeschylus's presentment of two problems each of eternal import though the form in which he contemplated them was the common theme of the greek drama these problems are one the retribution of crime two the inheritance or transmission of evil the views of the poet on each may perhaps be illustrated by a few excerpts from his writings it has been pointed out plumtree biographical essay that in many cases they are reflections on the nomai or current proverbs of the day the foundations of greek philosophy but often as forgotten as those who laid them sometimes the poet actually quotes and acknowledges the proverb as a trigeron muthos an immemorial saying but often it is probable that some piece of apparently irrelevant mysticism is in reality the poet's reflection on some saying familiar to his audience but not recognizable by us such for example i believe to be the case in the celebrated passage in agamemnon 160 zeus ostis potestin retribution among the dead this bitter name of murderous clings ever to my soul i wander scorned of all 
though he go down to the grave the guilty is never freed the sinner on whose hand is a stain of blood must see the furies rise at his side avengers of murder champions of the slain the furies lines one seventy five and three sixteen there is one who spoils the spoiler the slayer in his turn is slain while zeus is lord of the world it is fixed that all who sin shall suffer agamemnon line fifteen sixty two the anvil block of justice is planted firm fate the swordsmith hammers the steel of her design the mighty fury from her dark depth of counsel requites to the uttermost at last the guilt of blood shed forth of old the libation bearers line six forty seven there is a law that blood drops shed upon the ground demand other blood shed in requital murder calls aloud summoning a fury who brings a further woe sent up in vengeance from those who were slain before the libation bearers line four hundred inheritance of evil one said of old that the gods have no heed to punish him who tramples down the grace of things holy twas impiously said their vengeance is manifested upon the children of all who breathe forth rebellion over much what time their houses teem with wheel too great for man agamemnon line three sixty nine there is an ancient saying that human bliss if it reach its summit doth not die childless that from prosperity springs up a bane a woe insatiable i hold not so tis impious act that bears those many children all like the race from which they sprang but the house of the upright hath a blessed fate a progeny of good agamemnon line seven fifty these excerpts few out of many passages bearing on the same subject may perhaps be a help towards grasping the import of these dramas as a whole not the least of aeschylus's claims to honour is his divergence in some points from the traditional and accepted views of the time with respect to hereditary guilt and responsibility a belief in a jealous and vindictive power in children suffering for their father's sins in families lying under a curse for generations was not only familiar to the athenians of this epoch but approached the condition of an accepted tenet it was even at times a political force as in the case of pericles his membership of the alcmionid family which lay under a curse for the perfidious and impious murder of the partisans of chilon undoubtedly operated in his disfavour see thucydides book one chapter one twenty seven the proportion of people who believe in an unjust capricious and vindictive god may have diminished since the time of aeschylus and ezekiel yet to this day so large a minority are haunted by corresponding ideas so considerable even in our own time has been the political influence of such notions that the earnest protest of the hebrew prophet and the less distinct yet equally purified doctrine of the athenian poet can neither of them be said to have lost their importance nor to have done their work the eighteenth chapter of ezekiel and the third chorus of the agamemnon should be read together as the grandest assertions in pre-christian times of the justice of god the poetry of aeschylus is the precursor of the philosophy of plato the vague and mysterious problems over which the poet brooded became the subjects of moral philosophy in the next generation let it be remembered that we have in aeschylus the beginnings of speculation not its ultimate forms and the greatness of this first step will be at once apparent aeschylus deals especially with two popular theories one the doctrine of the jealousy of heaven against human prosperity as such and two the doctrine above mentioned of the inheritance of evil in certain families the first he may be said to deny the teaching of solon as recorded and exemplified by herodotus in the history of croesus book one chapters thirty through thirty three that the divine power is altogether jealous and loves to trouble the estate of man is confronted by aeschylus with the assertion of justice not caprice as ruling over man that this conception brought the poet into collision with the popular ideas of zeus is manifest from the drama of prometheus vinctus where unfortunately we have the problem without its solution the rest of the trilogy being lost that the national polytheism had little hold on his belief however largely it affected his poetry 
seems to me plain from all his deeper utterances notwithstanding the assertion of clausen to the contrary but of the poet's attitude towards the theory of a vindictive god there is no question i am alone in my thought he cries it is not wealth nor prosperity it is impiety that breeds other sins and woe for its sequel it is hard to resist the temptations of wealth and power and victory yet not these things but the yielding to their temptations do the gods punish not agamemnon's triumph not even the carnage of troy but his arrogance and pride on his return his making himself equal to the gods the second doctrine that of the inheritance of evil in certain families forms the groundwork of the whole trilogy and the poet's views on it must be collected they are nowhere concentrated or distinctly expressed substantially they appear to apply to the following condition of things the idea of an ate or inherited curse which dogs certain families has a double origin one an origin of fact the children are like their parents grow up under their influence borrow from their connection with them much of their own character two an origin in custom a family crime had a far more serious import to an ancient greek than we can readily realize it is the simple fact that the idea of individual responsibility and even of individual existence was almost absent from him the family was his unit the family sinned in the sin of any of its members the family exacted or suffered vengeance any member of the family who was slain by another was held to have incurred the stain of suicide the author of the trilogy endeavours to purify these ideas and to reconcile them alike with the doctrine of justice and with the facts of the world the reality of the curse is not denied but the voluntary nature of each stage in its history is asserted as is the responsibility of the individual criminal for his own act the temptation the predisposition may be extraneous may be imposed by heaven the deed is his own the first step he is master not to take but if once it be taken if the altar of right be once spurned the miserable desperate impulse is upon him he goes from sin to sin there is no help for him he has passed among the lost such i believe is the inner doctrine of aeschylus struggling to light through language of vague import and occasional inconsistencies especially in the relation of this process of evil to the divine will or permission nor must we forget his solution of the moral problem in the furies the family guilt and curse are to be closed by an appeal to human justice which measures the guilt of the individual by the circumstances and motives of his crime and has power to absolve as well as to mete out punishment to an admitted criminal granting as we must grant the belief in such an hereditary curse as aeschylus made the subject of his trilogy it is impossible to conceive a nobler solution of the problem a nobler purification by pity and terror if we may adopt in an extended sense aristotle's definition of tragedy perhaps it may not be out of place to say a few words with respect to a charge often brought against aeschylus of being a bombastic poet it is undeniable that in his earlier plays there is a tendency towards inflated language such prodigies as ephipsalosi kadzebrotithi sthenon from prometheus line three sixty two as alosimon paian ebedziak kathas seven against thebes line six thirty five show at all events a poetic artist who has not yet fully dissevered the large from the fine the grandiose from the grand neither are the thoughts in these plays always free from the same charge though the occurrence of metaphors which we regard as oriental seems to me to demonstrate capacity rather than extravagance in the greek poet it is surprising for instance to find in the celebrated description of the battle of salamis the persians line five seventy seven and of the floating corpses of the drowned persians and death gnawing upon them Skulontai pros anaudon paidon tas amiantu they are scattered and peeled by the voiceless children of the pure that is the sea it is surprising i say to find such a phrase treated as fantastic and oriental the same thought has been touched by shakespeare in the tempest act two scene one o thou mine heir of naples and of milan what strange fish hath made his meal on thee 
and by shelley in similes as a shark and dogfish wait under an atlantic isle for the negro ship whose freight is the theme of their debate wrinkling their red gills the while but how inferior each expression is to that of aeschylus need hardly be pointed out shakespeare's is simple almost to baldness shelley's powerfully almost horribly descriptive but aeschylus retaining the physical world skulontai paints the rest of the scene with a rich imagination the children of earth but now so clamorous are at the mercy of the still children of that sea whose translucent purity they have harassed and distracted in vain however this may be what i wish to point out is that all traces of immature work have disappeared when we reach the trilogy the sonorous verse remains but the exaggerated style is gone the ponderous imprecations of the prometheus or the seven against thebes have turned to verse like this matin teleon tis emis paidas dikin atin erinanth aisi tono esfads ego umoi phobu melathron elpis empatein occasionally as in the prophecy of calchas the oracular style is purposely assumed or as in the furies line two eighty five and following a scene of monstrous horrors is described in monstrous terms but of real bombast of large language misapplied there is no more with this disappearance a new faculty has arisen a dramatic art of the most admirable kind not even the excellent double interest of the oedipus tyrannus of sophocles is superior to the scene of clytemnestra's welcome of agamemnon with its effusive insincerity and ominous words of double and deadly meaning the whole character of clytemnestra is a refutation of those who maintain that we may find poetry in aeschylus but must go to sophocles or euripides for drama nor must we omit to notice the marvellous art displayed in the whole episode of cassandra her spirit is utterly full of apollo the sun-god the slayer of night a mention nay a mere hint of him puthakranta line twelve fifty five banishes in a moment her brief sanity and she bursts into ravings again she is penetrated with the fire intolerant and intense of his coming of the sunrise of prophecy burning brighter and clearer while in its light the great waves of doom roll up and on his approach is a scorching glow of fire before his presence is revealed papai oion to pur epergetai de moi ototoi auke apollon ah ah the fire it waxes nears me now woe woe for me apollo of the dawn and her last speech is a cry to the actual sun whose light she will see no more for ever to light her avengers to their work close inspection of all this scene will show aeschylus at his very highest point of inspiration it is as true and as imaginative as anything in king lear with respect to the text i think i have only once departed from usual interpretations where the text is mutilated or corrupt i have supplied or amended as the context seemed to direct to the extent of a word or two see appendix to the libation bearers the one occasion where my version differs i believe from any yet suggested is the celebrated passage from agamemnon lines one o five and seven etigar theothen katapnei patho miopan alka sumphutas ion this i have interpreted in opposition to those who have taken alka sumphutas ion as in some way describing the condition of the speaker i suggest that it may rather be taken closely with theothen and that the whole passage means still upon me doth the divine life whose strength waxes never old literally which is congenital with strength breathe from heaven the impulse of song this seems to suit the context well as i may shortly explain the chorus have just been bewailing the sad and tremulous weakness of old age too feeble for war too feeble to walk without a staff sad and presageful of future evils and only at moments roused to hope by propitious omens of sacrifice suddenly the light of comfort breaks upon them old and feeble they have yet the divine inspiration of song breathed on them from realms of help alka by powers which never wax old nor feeble 
then follows the matchless ode with its profound theology its analysis of human perplexity its utter pathos in describing the sacrifice of iphigenia in defence of this view i would urge that alka is not a usual word at least i have been unable to find an instance of its use for any mental power like genius or inspiration it almost always means physical prowess and if it becomes metaphorical at all it becomes so in the sense of help or aid as in the furies line two fifty seven alkan echon clasping or holding help by embracing the image of the goddess taking sanctuary in short if this view of the word be correct the word itself applies very ill to the chorus whose physical feebleness and powerlessness to help have just been alluded to but very well to the gods whose ageless strength and power to aid are contrasted with human weakness the thought is alka sumfutas ion will thus be parallel to that in agiro chrono dunastas of sophocles in antigone line six o eight undoubtedly there is a difficulty in applying such a phrase as sumfutas ion to the divine life at all but it seems allowable to use words properly only applicable to human life with reference to the divine in a passage like this wherein thought the contrast is drawn between the former as an ion sumfutas indeed but not alka sumfutas and the latter verily an ion in the wider sense an alka sumfutas coeval with its eternal power to prompt and aid and certainly the word katapneia in its most literal sense seems to suit this idea of a sacred impulse an aid like a wafting wind breathed down from heaven i put forward this conjecture without confidence and merely as one more endeavour to elucidate a passage of more than usual interest which is allowed to be dubious hitherto to make it refer to the life or condition of the speaker seems to me difficult to translate at the time coextensive with the war almost impossible whether my own conjecture is any better you decan alii for the feeling of the whole passage it might not be amiss to compare goethe's vindication of the honour and toil that await the old in song doch ins bekannte seitanspiel mit mut in anmut einzugreifen nach einem selbst gesteckten ziel mit holdem ihren hinzuschweifen das alte herrn ist eure pflicht faust part one theater prelude with respect to the translation my object has been throughout to be if possible readable i have sacrificed much that scholars might fairly desiderate reproduction of the original metres preservation of strophe and antistrophe and so forth on this ground that i found my own metrical skill insufficient to satisfy even myself in such a task i have little doubt that certain parts cassandra's earlier ravings for instance or the wrath of the furies would be most fitly rendered in prose like that of the analogous passages of king lear and macbeth but here too after a struggle i resigned the conflict it is easy to write prose it is impossible to write that prose the anapestic systems have been mostly rendered in octosyllabic metre where dactylic feet were predominant in the original i have sometimes adopted the heroic quatrain sometimes loose and irregular but always rhyming measures the earlier part of the third chorus of the agamemnon i have endeavoured to reproduce in that arrangement of octosyllabic verses used with such admirable effect by mr swinburne in the prologue and epilogue of songs before sunrise the iambic dialogue has been rendered into such blank verse or rhyming couplets as i could command the trochaic passages into rhyming verse of greater length any coincidences that may be found between other translations and the present may claim to be for the most part accidental whatever has been consciously adopted from elsewhere has been acknowledged in a footnote unless so familiar as to have become common property thus i have not thought it necessary to avow obvious obligations to shakespeare nor to ascribe the airy rings of the vulture's flight in the first chorus of the agamemnon to johnson nor the sleep of swords that fine rendering of the homeric calceas upnos to kingsley nor the rhythm of one choric passage in the libation bearers to w morris such things are public property now 
Part of this translation, that is, the Agamemnon, having been already published, I have had for that part the advantage of public criticism. I have carefully considered all such criticism, so far as it has reached me, and have removed, I hope, all positive errors that have been detected. Those critics who have complained rather of the general faults of the translation, such, for example, as diffuseness or a modern tone, than of particular errors, will, I hope, believe my assurance that their words have been duly weighed. If I have not recast the translation to the extent their criticism demanded, it is neither from doubting its substantial truth nor the seriousness of the fault. But I am not sanguine, after various attempts of my being able to translate in a closer and more pregnant style. It is not a question of how the thing could be done best in the abstract. It is, unfortunately, the more limited and painful question how a particular individual can do it least imperfectly. My main obligations in the matter of Aeschylus are expressed in the dedication. In addition, I am indebted to the Reverend W. A. Fearon, Assistant Master of Winchester, for revising a large part of the Agamemnon to Mr. C. Keegan Paul for useful criticisms, mainly though not wholly on the same play, to Mr. A. O. Prickard, fellow and lecturer of New College, Oxford, for incidental assistance throughout the work, particularly in the libation bearers and the furies, to Mr. C. B. Phillips, assistant master of Winchester, who has gone over the whole translation with care, to Mr. D. S. Margoliath, fellow of New College, Oxford, who has helped me especially with several difficulties in the Furies. Other friends will, I doubt not, accept the general acknowledgment of their aid. I cannot, however, leave unspecified my gratitude to Mr. F. R. Benson and the rest of the Oxford Company, who last year performed the Agamemnon on the stage for the practical insight they afforded their audience into the spectacular as well as the literary and dramatic merit of that noblest of poems. E. D. A. M. Winchester, March 1881. Preface to the Second Edition. In republishing the House of Atreus, I have striven to remove the flaws to which private or public criticism called my attention. A grave mistranslation of the Furies, line 216, has, I hope, been banished. Mr. A. O. Prickard and Professor Margoliath independently detected and denounced it to me. I now plead with Orestes, Miasma, Decpluton, Pele, Kronos, Kathire, Panta, Giraskon, Omu. I may be permitted to add a statement of the general principle that I have followed in making alterations. Errors in scholarship I have endeavored to remove. Where the English has been criticized, I have always considered and often obeyed the criticism. Sometimes I have resisted it in obedience to a higher law, for example, several critics objected to the use of the word spilth. I have retained it as used by Shakespeare, and therefore fitted for tragic poetry, though no longer in ordinary use. With regard to the form of the translation, I had not made any serious change. Were I now attempting the thing for the first time, I should not throw so much of the first chorus of the Agamemnon into quatrains but in this as in other cases that which was originally difficult to do has become almost impossible to undo and do again the previous translation stands like an erring and prohibitory ghost miket aselfis tade phonon e d a m winchester october eighteen ninety nine end of author's prefaces recording by expatriate in bangor maine Part One of Agamemnon by Aeschylus, translated by Edmund Doidge Anderson Morshead, eighteen forty nine to nineteen twelve. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Part One. Dramatis Personae, a Watchman, Chorus, Clytemnestra, a Herald, Agamemnon, Cassandra, Aegisthus the scene is the palace of atreus at mycenae in front of the palace stand statues of the gods and altars prepared for sacrifices a watchman i pray the gods to quit me of my toils 
to close the watch i keep this livelong year for as a watchdog lying not at rest propped on one arm upon the palace roof of atreus race too long too well i know the starry conclave of the midnight sky too well the splendours of the firmament the lords of light whose kingly aspect shows what time they set or climb the sky in turn the year's divisions bringing frost or fire and now as ever am i set to mark when shall stream up the glow of signal flame the bale fire bright and tell its trojan tale troy town is tame such issue holds in hope she in whose woman's breast beats heart of man thus upon mine unrestful couch i lie bathed with the dews of night unvisited by dreams ah me for in the place of sleep stands fear as my familiar and repels the soft repose that would mine eyelids seal and if at whiles for the lost balm of sleep i medicine my soul with melody of trill or song anon to tears i turn wailing the woe that broods upon this home not now by honour guided as of old but now at last fair fall the welcome hour that sets me free when ere the thick night glow with beacon fire of hope deferred no more all hail a beacon light is seen reddening the distant sky fire of the night that brings my spirit day shedding on argos light and dance and song greetings to fortune hail let my loud summons ring within the ears of agamemnon's queen that she anon start from her couch and with a shrill voice cry a joyous welcome to the beacon blaze for ilion's fall such fiery message gleams from yon high flame and i before the rest will foot the lightsome measure of our joy for i can say my master's dice fell fair behold the triple syce the lucky flame now be my lot to clasp in loyal love the hand of him restored who rules our home home but i say no more upon my tongue treads hard the ox of the adage had it voice the home itself might soothliest tell its tale i of set will speak words the wise may learn to others not remember nor discern exit the chorus of old men of mycenae enter each leaning on a staff during their song clytemnestra appears in the background kindling the altars chorus ten livelong years have rolled away since the twin lords of sceptred sway by zeus endowed with pride of place the doughty chiefs of atreus race went forth of yore to plead with priam face to face before the judgment seat of war a thousand ships from argive land put forth to bear the martial band that with a spirit stern and strong went out to right the kingdom's wrong pealed as they went the battle song wild as the vultures cry when o'er the eyrie soaring high in wild bereaved agony around around in airy rings they wheel with orage of their wings but not the aeus brood behold that called them to the nest of old but let apollo from the sky or pan or zeus but hear the cry the exile cry the wail forlorn of birds from whom their home is torn on those who wrought the rapine fell heaven sends the vengeful fiends of hell even so doth zeus the jealous lord and guardian of the hearth and board speed atreus sons in vengeful ire against paris sends them forth on fire her to buy back in war and blood whom one did wed but many wooed and many many by his will the last embrace of foes shall feel and many a knee in dust be bowed and splintered spears on shields ring loud of trojan and of greek before that iron bridal feast be o'er but as he willed tis ordered all and woes by heaven ordained must fall unsoothed by tears or spilth of wine poured forth too late the wrath divine glares vengeance on the flameless shrine and we in grey dishonoured eld feeble of frame unfit were held to join the warrior array that then went forth unto the fray and here at home we tarry fain our feeble footsteps to sustain each on his staff so strength doth wane and turns to childishness again for while the sap of youth is green and yet unripened leaps within the young are weakly as the old and each alike unmeet to hold the vantage post of war and ah when flower and fruit are o'er and on life's tree the leaves are sere 
age wendeth propped its journey drear as forceless as a child as light and fleeting as a dream of night lost in the garish day but thou o child of tyndareus queen clytemnestra speak and say what messenger of joy to-day hath won thine ear what welcome news that thus in sacrificial wise e'en to the city's boundaries thou biddest altar fires arise each god who doth our city guard and keeps o'er argos watch and ward from heaven above from earth below the mighty lords who rule the skies the market's lesser deities to each and all the altars glow piled for the sacrifice and here and there anear afar streams skyward many a beacon star conjured and charmed and kindled well by pure oil's soft and guileless spell hid now no more within the palace secret store o queen we pray thee whatsoe'er known unto thee were well revealed that thou wilt trust it to our ear and bid our anxious heart be healed that waneth now unto despair now waxing to a presage fair dawns from the altar hope to scare from our rent hearts the vulture care list for the power is mine to chant on high the chief's emprise the strength that omens gave list on my soul breathes yet a harmony from realms of ageless powers and strong to save how brother kings twin lords of one command led forth the youth of hellas in their flower urged on their way with vengeful spear and brand by warrior birds that watched the parting hour go forth to troy the eagles seemed to cry and the sea kings obeyed the sky king's word when on the right they soared across the sky and one was black one bore a white tail barred high o'er the palace were they seen to soar then lit in sight of all in rent and tear far from the fields that they should range no more big with her unborn brood a mother hare and one beheld the soldier prophet true and the two chiefs unlike of soul and will in the twy-coloured eagle straight he knew and spake the omen forth for good and ill ah woe and well a day but be the issue fair go forth he cried and priam's town shall fall yet long the time shall be and flock and herd the people's wealth that roam before the wall shall force hew down when fate shall give the word but oh beware lest wrath in heaven abide to dim the glowing battle forge once more and mar the mighty curb of trojan pride the steel of vengeance welded as for war for virgin artemis bears jealous hate against the royal house the eagle pair who rend the unborn brood insatiate yea loathes their banquet on the quivering hair ah woe and well a day but be the issue fair for well she loves the goddess kind and mild the tender new-born cubs of lions bold too weak to range and well the sucking child of every beast that roamed by wood and wold so to the lord of heaven she prayeth still nay if it must be be the omen true yet do the visioned eagles presage ill the end be well but crossed with evil too healer apollo be her wrath controlled nor weave the long delay of thwarting gales to war against the danaeans and withhold from the free ocean waves their eager sails she craves alas to see a second life shed forth a cursed unhallowed sacrifice twixt wedded souls artificer of strife and hate that knows not fear and fell device at home there tarries like a lurking snake biding its time a wrath unreconciled a wily watcher passionate to slake in blood resentment for a murdered child such was the mighty warning pealed of yore amid good tidings such the word of fear what time the fateful eagles hovered o'er the kings and calchas read the omen clear and leave the league of ships and fail each true ally for rightfully they crave with eager fiery mind the virgin's blood shed forth to lull the adverse wind god send the deed be well thus on his neck he took fate's hard compelling yoke then in the counter gale of will abhorred accursed to recklessness his shifting spirit veered alas that frenzy first of ills and worst with evil craft men's souls to sin hath ever stirred and so he steeled his heart ah well a day aiding a war for one false woman's sake his child to slay 
and with her spilt blood make an offering to speed the ships upon their way lusting for war the bloody arbiters closed heart and ears and would nor hear nor heed the girl voice plead pity me father nor her prayers nor tender virgin years so when the chant of sacrifice was done her father bade the youthful priestly train raise her like some poor kid above the altar stone from where amid her robes she lay sunk all in swoon away bade them as with the bit that mutely tames the steed her fair lipped speech refrain lest she should speak a curse on atreus home and seed so trailing on the earth her robe of saffron dye with one last piteous dart from her beseeching eye those that should smite she smote fair silent as a pictured form but fain to plead is all forgot how oft those halls of old wherein my sire high feast did hold rang to the virginal soft strain when i a stainless child sang from pure lips and undefiled sang of my sire and all his honoured life and how on him should fall heaven's highest gift and gain and then but i beheld not nor can tell what further fate befell but this is sure that calchas boding strain can ne'er be void or vain this wage from justice hand do sufferers earn the future to discern and yet farewell o secret of to-morrow foreknowledge is for sorrow clear with the clear beams of the morrow's sun the future presseth on now let the house's tale how dark so e'er find yet an issue fair so prays the loyal solitary band that guards the apian land they turn to clytemnestra who leaves the altars and comes forward o queen i come in reverence of thy sway for while the ruler's kingly seat is void the loyal heart before his consort bends now be it sure and certain news of good or the fair tidings of a flattering hope that bids thee spread the light from shrine to shrine ay fain to hear yet grudge not if thou hide clytemnestra as saith the adage from the womb of night spring forth with promise fair the young child light i fairer even than all hope my news by grecian hands is priam's city tain chorus what sayest thou doubtful heart makes treacherous ear clytemnestra hear then again and plainly troy is ours chorus thrills through my heart such joy as wakens tears clytemnestra ay through those tears thine eye looks loyalty chorus but hast thou proof to make assurance sure clytemnestra go to i have unless the god has lied chorus has some night vision won thee to belief clytemnestra out on all presage of a slumbrous soul chorus but wert thou cheered by rumour's wingless word clytemnestra peace thou dost chide me as a credulous girl chorus say then how long ago the city fell clytemnestra even in this night that now brings forth the dawn chorus yet who so swift could speed the message here clytemnestra from ida's top hephaestus lord of fire sent forth his sign and on and ever on beacon to beacon sped the courier flame from ida to the crag that hermes loves of lemnos thence unto the steep sublime of athos throne of zeus the broad blaze flared thence raised aloft to shoot across the sea the moving light rejoicing in its strength sped from the pyre of pine and urged its way in golden glory like some strange new sun onward and reached machistus watching heights there with no dull delay nor heedless sleep the watcher sped the tidings on in turn until the guard upon mesapius peak saw the fair flame gleam on Europus tide and from the high piled heap of withered firs lit the new sign and bade the message on then the strong light far flown and yet undimmed shot through the sky above asopus plain bright as the moon and on Catharan's crag aroused another watch of flying fire and there the sentinels no whit disowned but sent redoubled on the hest of flame swift shot the light above gorgopis bay to egiplanctus mount and bade the peak fail not the onward ordinance of fire 
and like a long beard streaming in the wind full fed with fuel roared and rose the blaze and onward flaring gleamed above the cape beneath which shimmers the saronic bay and thence leapt light unto arachne's peak the mountain watch that looks upon our town thence to the atreides roof in lineage fair a bright posterity of ida's fire so sped from stage to stage fulfilled in turn flame after flame along the course ordained and lo the last to speed upon its way sights the end first and glows unto the goal and troy is tain and by this sign my lord tells me the tale and ye have learned my word chorus to heaven o queen will i upraise new song but wouldst thou speak once more i fain would hear from first to last the marvel of the tale clytemnestra think you this very morn the greeks in troy and loud therein the voice of utter wail within one cup pour vinegar and oil and look unblent unreconciled they wore so in the twofold issue of the strife mingle the victors shout the captives moan for all the conquered whom the sword has spared cling weeping some unto a brother slain some childlike to a nursing father's form and wail the loved and lost the while their neck bows down already neath the captive's chain and lo the victors now the fight is done goaded by restless hunger far and wide range all disordered through the town to snatch such victual and such rest as chance may give within the captive halls that once were troy joyful to rid them of the frost and dew wherein they couched upon the plain of old joyful to sleep the gracious night all through unsummoned of the watching sentinel yet let them reverence well the city's gods the lords of troy though fallen and her shrines so shall the spoilers not in turn be spoiled yea let no craving for forbidden gain bid conquerors yield before the darts of greed for we need yet before the race be won homewards unharmed to round the course once more for should the host wax wanton ere it come then though the sudden blow of fate be spared yet in the sight of god shall rise once more the great wrong of the slain to claim revenge now hearing from this woman's mouth of mine the tale and eke its warning pray with me luck sway the scale with no uncertain poise for my fair hopes are changed to fairer joys chorus a gracious word thy woman's lips have told worthy a wise man's utterance o my queen now with clear trust in thy convincing tale i set me to salute the gods with song who bring us bliss to counterpoise our pain exit clytemnestra zeus lord of heaven and welcome knight of victory that hast our might with all the glories crowned on towers of ilion free no more hast flung the mighty mesh of war and closely girt them round till neither warrior may scape nor stripling lightly overleap the trammels as they close and close till with a grip of doom our foes in slavery's coil are bound zeus lord of hospitality in grateful awe i bend to thee tis thou hast struck the blow at alexander long ago we marked thee bend thy vengeful bow but long and warily withhold the eager shaft which uncontrolled and loosed too soon or launched too high had wandered bloodless through the sky zeus the high god whate'er be dim in doubt this can our thought track out the blow that fells the sinner is of god and as he wills the rod of vengeance smiteth sore one said of old the gods list not to hold a reckoning with him whose feet oppress the grace of holiness an impious word for whensoe'er the sire breathed forth rebellious fire what time his household overflowed the measure of bliss and health and treasure his children's children read the reckoning plain at last in tears and pain on me let wheel that brings no woe be sent and therewith all content who spurns the shrine of right nor wealth nor power shall be to him a tower to guard him from the gulf there lies his lot where all things are forgot lust drives him on lust desperate and wild fate's sin contriving child and cure is none beyond concealment clear kindles sin's baleful glare as an ill coin beneath the wearing touch betrays by stain and smutch 
its metal false such is the sinful wight before on pinion's light fair pleasure flits and lures him childlike on while home and kin make moan beneath the grinding burden of his crime till in the end of time cast down of heaven he pours forth fruitless prayer to powers that will not hear and such did paris come unto atriades home and thence with sin and shame his welcome to repay ravish the wife away and she unto her country and her kin leaving the clash of shields and spears and arming ships and bearing unto troy destruction for a dower and overbold in sin went fleetly through the gates at midnight hour oft from the prophet's lips moaned out the warning and the wail ah woe woe for the home the home and for the chieftains woe woe for the bride-bed warm yet from the lovely limbs the impress of the form of her who loved her lord a while ago and woe for him who stands shamed silent unreproachful stretching hands that find her not and sees yet will not see that she is far away and his sad fancy yearning o'er the sea shall summon and recall her wraith once more to queen it in his hall and sad with many memories the fair cold beauty of each sculptured face and all to hatefulness is turned her grace seen blankly by forlorn and hungering eyes and when the night is deep come visions sweet and sad and bearing pain of hopings vain void void and vain for scarce the sleeping sight has seen its old delight when through the grasps of love that bid it stay it vanishes away on silent wings that roam adown the ways of sleep such are the sights the sorrows fell above our hearth and worse whereof i may not tell but all the wide town o'er each home that sent its master far away from hellish shore feels the keen thrill of heart the pang of loss to-day for truth to say the touch of bitter death is manifold familiar was each face and dear as life that went unto the war but thither whence a warrior went of old doth not return only a spear and sword and ashes in an urn for ares lord of strife who doth the swaying scales of battle hold war's money-changer giving dust for gold sends back to hearts that held them dear scant ash of warriors wept with many a tear light to the hand but heavy to the soul yea fills the light urn full with what survived the flame death's dusty measure of a hero's frame alas one cries and yet alas again our chief is gone the hero of the spear and hath not left his peer ah woe another moans my spouse is slain the death of honour rolled in dust and blood slain for a woman's sin a false wife's shame such muttered words of bitter mood rise against those who went forth to reclaim yea jealous wrath creeps on against the atreides name and others far beneath the ilian wall sleep their last sleep the goodly chiefs and tall couched in the foeman's land whereon they gave their breath and lords of troy each in his trojan grave End of part one. Recording by expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Part two of Agamemnon by Aeschylus. Translated by Edmund Doidge Anderson Morshead, 1849 to 1912. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Part two the chorus continues therefore for each and all the city's breast is heavy with a wrath suppressed as deep and deadly as a curse more loud flung by the common crowd and brooding deeply doth my soul await tidings of coming fate buried as yet in darkness womb for not forgetful is the high god's doom against the sons of carnage all too long seems the unjust to prosper and be strong till the dark furies come and smite with stern reversal all his home down into dim obstruction he is gone and help and hope among the lost is none or him who vaunteth an exceeding fame impends a woe condign the vengeful bolt upon his eyes doth flame sped from the hand divine this bliss be mine ungrudged of god to feel 
to tread no city to the dust nor see my own life thrust down to a slave's estate beneath another's heel behold throughout the city wide have the swift feet of rumour hide roused by the joyful flame but is the news they scatter sooth or haply do they give for truth some cheat which heaven doth frame a child were he and all unwise who let his heart with joy be stirred to see the beacon fires arise and then beneath some thwarting word sicken anon with hope deferred the edge of woman's insight still good news from true divideth ill light rumours leap within the bound that fences female credence round but lightly born as lightly dies the tale that springs of her surmise soon shall we know whereof the balefires tell the beacons kindled with transmitted flame whether as well i deem their tale is true or whether like some dream delusive came the welcome blaze but to befool our soul for lo i see a herald from the shore draw hither shadowed with the olive wreath and thirsty dust twin brother of the clay speaks plain of travel far and truthful news no dumb surmise nor tongue of flame and smoke fitfully kindled from the mountain pyre but plainlier shall his voice say all is well or but away forebodings adverse now and on fair promise fair fulfilment come and whoso for the state prays otherwise himself reap harvest of his ill desire enter herald o oh, land of argos fatherland of mine to thee at last beneath the tenth year's sun my feet return the bark of my emprise though one by one hope's anchors broke away held by the last and now ride safely here long long my soul despaired to win in death its longed for rest within our argive land and now all hail o earth and hail to thee new risen sun and hail our country's god high ruling zeus and thou the pythian lord whose arrows smote us once smite thou no more was not thy wrath wreaked full upon our heads o king apollo by scamander's side turn thou be turned be saviour healer now and hail all gods who rule the street and mart and hermes hail my patron and my pride herald of heaven and lord of heralds here and heroes ye who sped us on our way to one and all i cry receive again with grace such argives as the spear has spared ah home of royalty beloved halls and solemn shrines and gods that front the morn benign as erst with sun-flushed aspect greet the king returning after many days for as from night flash out the beams of day so out of darkness dawns a light a king on you on argos agamemnon comes then hail and greet him well such meed befits him whose right hand hewed down the towers of troy with the great axe of zeus who righteth wrong and smote the plain smote down to nothingness each altar every shrine and far and wide dies from the whole land's face its offspring fair such mighty yoke of fate he set on troy our lord and monarch atreus elder son and comes at last with blissful honour home highest of all who walk on earth to-day not paris nor the city's self that paid sin's price with him can boast whate'er befall the guerdon we have won outweighs it all but at fate's judgment seat the robber stands condemned of rapine and his prey is torn forth from his hands and by his deed is reaped a bloody harvest of his home and land gone down to death and for his guilt and lust his father's race pays double in the dust chorus hail herald of the greeks new come from war herald all hail not death itself can fright me now chorus was thine heart wrung with longing for thy land herald so that this joy doth brim mine eyes with tears chorus on you too then this sweet distress did fall herald how sayst thou make me master of thy word chorus you long for us who pined for you again herald craved the land us who craved it love for love chorus yea till my brooding heart moaned out with pain 
herald whence thy despair that mars the army's joy chorus sole cure of wrong is silence saith the saw herald thy kings afar couldst thou fear other men chorus death had been sweet as thou didst say but now herald tis true fate smiles at last throughout our toil these many years some chances issued fair and some i wot were chequered with a curse but who on earth hath won the bliss of heaven through time's whole tenor and unbroken wheel i could a tale unfold of toiling oars ill rest scant landings on a shore rock strewn all pains all sorrows for our daily doom and worse and hatefuler are woes on land for where we couched close by the foeman's wall the river plain was ever dank with dews dropped from the sky exuded from the earth a curse that clung unto our sodden garb and hair as horrent as a wild beast fell why tell the woes of winter when the birds lay stark and stiff so stern was ida's snow or summer's scorch what time the stirless wave sank to its sleep beneath the noonday sun why mourn old woes their pain has passed away and passed away from those who fell all care for evermore to rise and live again why sum the count of death and render thanks for life by moaning over fate malign farewell a long farewell to all our woes to us the remnant of the host of greece comes weal beyond all counterpoise of woe thus boast we rightfully to yonder sun like him far fleeted over sea and land the argive host prevailed to conquer troy and in the temples of the gods of greece hung up these spoils a shining sign to time let those who learn this legend bless aright the city and its chieftains and repay the meed of gratitude to zeus who willed and wrought the deed so stands the tale fulfilled chorus thy words o'erbear my doubt for news of good the ear of age hath ever youth and now but those within in clytemnestra's self would fain hear all glad thou their ears and mine re-enter clytemnestra last night when first the fiery courier came in sign that troy is ta'en and raised to earth so wild a cry of joy my lips gave out that i was chidden hath the beacon watch made sure unto thy soul the sack of troy a very woman thou whose heart leaps light at wandering rumours and with words like these they showed me how i strayed misled of hope yet on each shrine i set the sacrifice and in the strain they held for feminine went heralds through the city to and fro with voice of loud proclaim announcing joy and in each fane they lit and quenched with wine the spicy perfumes fading in the flame all is fulfilled i spare your longer tale the king himself anon shall tell me all remains to think what honour best may greet my lord the majesty of argos home what day beams fairer on a woman's eyes than this whereon she flings the portals wide to hail her lord heaven shielded home from war this to my husband that he tarry not but turn the city's longing into joy yea let him come and coming may he find a wife no other than he left her true and faithful as a watchdog to his home his foeman's foe in all her duties leal trusty to keep for ten long years unmarred the store whereon he set his master seal be steel deep dyed before ye look to see ill joy ill fame from other white in me herald tis fairly said thus speaks a noble dame nor speaks amiss when truth informs the boast exit clytemnestra chorus so has she spoken be it yours to learn by clear interpreters her specious word turn to me herald tell me if anon the second well-loved lord of argos comes hath menelaus safely sped with you herald alas brief boon unto my friends it were to flatter them for truth with falsehoods fair chorus speak joy if truth be joy but truth at worst too plainly truth and joy are here divorced herald the hero and his bark were rapt away far from the grecian fleet tis truth i say chorus whether in all men's sight from ilion born 
or from the fleet by stress of weather torn herald full on the mark thy shaft of speech doth light and one short word hath told long woes aright chorus but say what now of him each comrade saith what their forebodings of his life or death herald ask me no more the truth is known to none save the earth fostering all surveying sun chorus say by what doom the fleet of greece was driven how rose how sank the storm the wrath of heaven herald nay ill it were to mar with sorrow's tale the day of blissful news the gods demand thanksgiving sundered from solicitude if one as herald came with rueful face to say the curse has fallen and the host gone down to death and one wide wound has reached the city's heart and out of many homes many are cast and consecrate to death beneath the double scourge that ares loves the bloody pair the fire and sword of doom if such sore burden weighed upon my tongue twere fit to speak such words as gladden fiends but coming as he comes who bringeth news of safe return from toil and issues fair to men rejoicing in a weal restored dare i to dash good words with ill and say how the god's anger smote the greeks in storm for fire and sea that erst held bitter feud now swore conspiracy and pledged their faith wasting the argives worn with toil and war night and great horror of the rising wave came o'er us and the blasts that blow from thrace clash ship with ship and some with plunging prow through scudding drifts of spray and raving storm vanished as strays by some ill shepherd driven and when at length the sun rose bright we saw the aegean sea-field flecked with flowers of death corpses of grecian men and shattered hulls for us indeed some god as well i deem no human power laid hand upon our helm snatched us or prayed us from the powers of air and brought our bark through all unharmed in hull and saving fortune sat and steered us fair so that no surge should gulf us deep in brine nor grind our keel upon a rocky shore so scaped we death that lurks beneath the sea but under day's white light mistrustful all of fortune's smile we sat and brooded deep shepherds forlorn of thoughts that wandered wild o'er this new woe for smitten was our host and lost as ashes scattered from the pyre of whom if any draw his life breath yet be well assured he deems of us as dead as we of him no other fate forebode but heaven save all if menelaus live he will not tarry but will surely come therefore if anywhere the high sun's ray describes him upon earth preserved by zeus who wills not yet to wipe his race away hope still there is that homeward he may wend enough thou hast the truth unto the end chorus say from whose lips the presage fell who read the future all too well and named her in her natal hour helen the bride with war for dower twas one of the invisible guiding his tongue with prescient power on fleet and host and citadel war sprung from her and death did lower when from the bride-bed's fine-spun veil she to the zephyr spread her sail strong blew the breeze the surge closed o'er the cloven track of keel and oar but while she fled there drove along fast in her wake a mighty throng a thirst for blood a thirst for war forward in fell pursuit they sprung then leapt on simoy's bank ashore the leafy coppices among no rangers they of wood and field but huntsmen of the sword and shield heaven's jealousy that works its will sped thus on troy its destined ill well named at once the bride and bane and loud rang out the bridal strain but they to whom that song befell did turn anon to tears again zeus tarries but avenges still the husband's wrong the household's stain he the hearth's lord brooks not to see its outraged hospitality even now and in far other tone troy chants her dirge of mighty moan woe upon paris woe and hate who wooed his country's doom for mate this is the burthen of the groan wherewith she wails disconsolate the blood so many of her own have poured in vain to fend her fate troy thou hast fed and freed to rome a lion-cub within thy home 
a suckling creature newly ta'en from mother's teat still fully fain of nursing care and oft caressed within the arms upon the breast even as an infant has it lain or fawns and licks by hunger pressed the hand that will assuage its pain in life's young dawn a well-loved guest a fondling for the children's play a joy unto the old and grey but waxing time and growth betrays the bloodthirst of the lion race and for the house's fostering care unbidden all it revels there and bloody recompense repays rent flesh of kind its talons tear a mighty beast that slays and slays and mars with blood the household fair a god-sent pest invincible a minister of fate and hell even so to ilion city came by stealth a spirit as of windless seas and skies a gentle phantom form of joy and wealth with love's soft arrows speeding from its eyes love's rose whose thorn doth pierce the soul in subtle wise ah well a day the bitter bridal bed when the fair mischief lay by paris side what curse on palace and on people sped with her the fury sent on priam's pride by angered zeus what tears of many a widowed bride long long ago to mortals this was told how sweet security and blissful state have curses for their children so men hold and for the man of all too prosperous fate springs from a bitter seed some woe insatiate alone alone i deem far otherwise not bliss nor wealth it is but impious deed from which that aftergrowth of ill doth rise woe springs from wrong the plant is like the seed while right in honour's house doth its own likeness breed some past impiety some grey old crime breeds the young curse that wantons in our ill early or late when haps the appointed time and out of light brings power of darkness still a master fiend a foe unseen invincible a pride accursed that broods upon the race and home in which dark ate holds her sway sins child and woes that wears its parent's face while right in smoky cribs shines clear as day and decks with wheel his life who walks the righteous way from gilded halls that hands polluted raise right turns away with proud averted eyes and of the wealth men stamp amiss with praise heedless to poorer holier temples highs and to fate's goal guides all in its appointed wise hail to thee chief of atreus race returning proud from troy subdued how shall i greet thy conquering face how nor a fulsome praise obtrude nor stint the meed of gratitude for mortal men who fall to ill take little heed of open truth but seek unto its semblance still the show of weeping and of ruth to the forlorn will all men pay but of the grief their eyes display naught to the heart doth pierce its way and with the joyous they beguile their lips into a feigned smile and force a joy unfelt the while but he who as a shepherd wise doth know his flock can ne'er misread truth in the falsehood of his eyes who veils beneath a kindly guise a lukewarm love indeed and thou our leader when of yore thou badest greece go forth to war for helen's sake i dare avow that then i held thee not as now that to my vision thou didst seem died in the hues of disesteem i held thee for a pilot ill and reckless of thy proper will endowing others doomed to die with vain and forced audacity now from my heart ungrudgingly to those that wrought this word be said well fall the labour ye have sped let time and search o king declare what men within thy city's bound were loyal to the kingdom's care and who were faithless found enter agamemnon in a chariot accompanied by cassandra he speaks without descending agamemnon first as is meet a king's all hail be said to argos and the gods that guard the land gods who with me availed to speed us home with me availed to wring from priam's town the dew of justice in the court of heaven the gods in conclave sat and judged the cause not from a pleader's tongue and at the close unanimous into the urn of doom 
this sentence gave on ilion and her men death and where hope drew nigh to pardon's urn no hand there was to cast a vote therein and still the smoke of fallen ilion rises in sight of all men and the flame of ate's hecatomb is living yet and where the towers in dusty ashes sink rise the rich fumes of pomp and wealth consumed for this must all men pay unto the gods the meed of mindful hearts and gratitude for by our hands the meshes of revenge closed on the prey and for one woman's sake troy trodden by the argive monster lies the foal the shielded band that leapt the wall what time with autumn sank the pleiades yea o'er the fencing wall a lion sprang ravening and lapped his fill of blood of kings such prelude spoken to the gods in full to you i turn and to the hidden thing whereof ye spake but now and in that thought i am as you and what ye say say i for few are they who have such inborn grace as to look up with love and envy not when stands another on the height of weal deep in his heart whom jealousy hath seized for poison lurking doth enhance his load for now beneath his proper woes he chafes and sighs withal to see another's weal i speak not idly but from knowledge sure there be who vaunt in utter loyalty that is but as the ghost of friendship dead a shadow in a glass of faith gone by one only he who went reluctant forth across the seas with me odysseus he was loyal unto me with strength and will a trusty trace-horse bound unto my car thus be he yet beneath the light of day or dead as well i fear i speak his praise lastly whate'er be due to men or gods with joint debate in public council held we will decide and warily contrive that all which now is well may so abide for that which haply needs the healer's art that will we medicine discerning well if cautery or knife befit the time now to my palace and the shrines of home i will pass in and greet you first and fair ye gods who bade me forth and home again and long may victory tarry in my train enter clytemnestra followed by maidens bearing purple robes clytemnestra old men of argos lieges of our realm shame shall not bid me shrink lest ye should see the love i bear my lord such blushing fear dies at the last from hearts of humankind from mine own soul and from no alien lips i know and will reveal the life i bore reluctant through the lingering livelong years the while my lord beleaguered ilion's wall first that a wife sat sundered from her lord in widowed solitude was utter woe and woe to hear how rumours many tongues all boded evil woe when he who came and he who followed spake of ill on ill keening lost lost all lost through hall and bower had this my husband met so many wounds as by a thousand channels rumour told no network e'er was full of holes as he had he been slain as oft as tidings came that he was dead he well might boast him now a second gurion of triple frame with triple robe of earth above him laid for that below no matter triply dead dead by one death for every form he bore and thus distraught by news of wrath and woe oft for self-slaughter had i slung the noose but others wrenched it from my neck away hence haps it that orestes thine and mine the pledge and symbol of our wedded troth stands not beside us now as he should stand nor marvel thou at this he dwells with one who guards him loyally tis phocus king strophius who warned me erst bethink thee queen what woes of doubtful issue well may fall thy lord in daily jeopardy at troy while here a populace uncurbed may cry down with the council down bethink thee too tis the world's way to set a harder heel on fallen power for thy child's absence then such mine excuse no wily afterthought for me long since the gushing fount of tears is wept away no drop is left to shed dim are the eyes that ever watch till dawn weeping the bale-fires piled for thy return night after night unkindled 
if i slept each sound the tiny humming of a gnat roused me again again from fitful dreams wherein i felt thee smitten saw thee slain thrice for each moment of mine hour of sleep all this i bore and now released from woe i hail my lord as watchdog of a fold as saving stay-rope of a storm-tossed ship as column stout that holds the roof aloft as only child unto a sire bereaved as land beheld past hope by crews forlorn as sunshine fair when tempest's wrath is past as gushing spring to thirsty wayfarer so sweet it is to scape the press of pain with such salute i bid my husband hail nor heaven be wroth therewith for long and hard i bore that ire of old sweet lord step forth step from thy car i pray nay not on earth plant the proud foot o king that trod down troy women why tarry ye whose task it is to spread your monarch's path with tapestry swift swift with purple strew his passage fair that justice lead him to a home at last he scarcely looked to see for what remains zeal unsubdued by sleep shall nerve my hand to work as right and as the gods command end of part two recording by expatriate in bangor maine part three of agamemnon by aeschylus translated by edmund doidge anderson morshead eighteen forty nine to nineteen twelve this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine part three agamemnon daughter of leda watcher o'er my home thy greeting well befits mine absence long for late and hardly has it reached its end know that the praise which honour bids us crave must come from others lips not from our own see too that not in fashion feminine thou make a warrior's pathway delicate not unto me as to some eastern lord bowing thyself to earth to make homage loud strew not this purple that shall make each step an arrogance such pomp beseems the gods not me a mortal man to set his foot on these rich dyes i hold such pride in fear and bid thee honour me as man not god fear not such foot-cloths and all gods apart loud from the trump of fame my name is blown best gift of heaven it is in glory's hour to think thereon with soberness and thou bethink thee of the adage call none blessed till peaceful death have crowned a life of weal tis said i fain would fare unvexed by fear clytemnestra nay but unsay it thwart not thou my will agamemnon no i have said and will not mar my word clytemnestra was it fear made this meekness to the gods agamemnon if cause be cause tis mine for this resolve clytemnestra what think'st thou in thy place had priam done agamemnon he surely would have walked on broidered robes clytemnestra then fear not thou the voice of human blame agamemnon yet mighty is the murmur of a crowd clytemnestra shrink not from envy appanage of bliss agamemnon war is not woman's part nor war of words clytemnestra yet happy victors well may yield therein agamemnon dost crave for triumph in this petty strife clytemnestra yield of thy grace permit me to prevail agamemnon then if thou wilt let some one stoop to loose swiftly these sandals slaves beneath my foot and stepping thus upon the sea's rich dye i pray let none among the gods look down with jealous eye on me reluctant all to trample thus and mar a thing of price wasting the wealth of garments silver worth enough hereof and for the stranger maid lead her within but gently god on high looks graciously on him whose triumph's hour has made not pitiless none willingly wear the slave's yoke and she the prize and flower of all we won comes hither in my train gift of the army to its chief and lord now since in this my will bows down to thine i will pass in on purples to my home clytemnestra a sea there is 
and who shall stay its springs and deep within its breast a mighty store precious as silver of the purple dye whereby the dipped robe doth its tint renew enough of such o king within thy halls there lies a store that cannot fail but i i would have gladly vowed unto the gods cost of a thousand garments trodden thus had once the oracle such gift required contriving ransom for thy life preserved for while the stock is firm the foliage climbs spreading a shade what time the dog-star glows and thou returning to thine hearth and home art as a genial warmth in winter hours or as a coolness when the lord of heaven mellows the juice within the bitter grape such boons and more doth bring into a home the present footstep of its proper lord zeus zeus fulfilment's lord my vows fulfil and whatsoe'er it be work forth thy will exeunt all but cassandra and the chorus chorus wherefore forever on the wings of fear hovers a vision drear before my boding heart a strain unbidden and unwelcome thrills mine ear oracular of pain not as of old upon my bosom's throne sits confidence to spurn such fears like dreams we know not to discern old old and grey long since the time has grown which saw the linked cables moor the fleet when erst it came to ilion's sandy shore and now mine eyes and not another see their safe return yet none the less in me the inner spirit sings a boding song self-prompted sings the fury strain and seeks and seeks in vain to hope and to be strong ah to some end of fate unseen unguessed are these wild throbbings of my heart and breast yea of some doom they tell each pulse a knell leaf leaf i were that all to unfulfilment's hidden realm might fall too far too far our mortal spirits strive grasping at utter weal unsatisfied till the fell curse that dwelleth hard beside thrust down the sundering wall too fair they blow the gales that waft our bark on fortune's tide swiftly we sail the sooner all to drive upon the hidden rock the reef of woe then if the hand of caution warily sling forth into the sea part of the freight lest all should sink below from the deep death it saves the bark even so doom laden though it be once more may rise his household who is timely wise how oft the famine-stricken field is saved by god's large gift the new year's yield the blood of man once spilled once at his feet shed forth and darkening the plain nor chant nor charm can call it back again so zeus hath willed else had he spared the leech asclepius skilled to bring men from the dead the hand divine did smite himself with death a warning and a sign ah me if fate ordained of old held not the will of gods constrained controlled helpless to usward and apart swifter than speech my heart had poured its presage out now fretting chafing in the dark of doubt tis hopeless to unfold truth from fear's tangled skein and yearning to proclaim its thought my soul is prophecy in flame re-enter clytemnestra get thee within thou too cassandra go for zeus to thee in gracious mercy grants to share the sprinklings of the lustral bowl beside the altar of his guardianship slave among many slaves what haughty still step from the car alcmena's son tis said was sold perforce and bore the yoke of old ay hard it is but if such fate befall tis a fair chance to serve within a home of ancient wealth and power an upstart lord to whom wealth's harvest came beyond his hope is as a lion to his slaves in all exceeding fierce immoderate in sway pass in thou hearest what our ways will be chorus clear unto thee o maid is her command but thou within the toils of fate thou art if such thy will i urge thee to obey yet i misdoubt thou dost nor hear nor heed clytemnestra i wot unless like swallows she doth use some strange barbarian tongue from over sea my words must speak persuasion to her soul chorus obey 
there is no gentler way than this step from the car's high seat and follow her clytemnestra truce to this bootless waiting here without i will not stay beside the central shrine the victims stand prepared for knife and fire offerings from hearts beyond all hope made glad thou if thou reckest aught of my command twere well done soon but if thy sense be shut from these my words let thy barbarian hand fulfil by gesture the default of speech chorus no native is she thus to read thy words unaided like some wild thing of the wood new trapped behold she shrinks and glares on thee clytemnestra tis madness and the rule of mind distraught since she beheld her city sink in fire and hither comes nor brooks the bit until in foam and blood her wrath be champed away see ye to her unqueenly tis for me unheeded thus to cast away my words exit clytemnestra chorus but with me pity sits in anger's place poor maiden come thou from the car no way there is but this take up thy servitude cassandra woe woe alas earth mother earth and thou apollo apollo chorus peace shriek not to the bright prophetic god who will not brook the suppliance of woe cassandra woe woe alas earth mother earth and thou apollo apollo chorus hark with wild curse she calls anew on him who stands far off and loathes the voice of wail cassandra apollo apollo god of all ways but only deaths to me once and again o thou destroyer named thou hast destroyed me thou my love of old chorus she grows presageful of her woes to come slave though she be instinct with prophecy cassandra apollo apollo god of all ways but only deaths to me o thou apollo thou destroyer named what way hast led me to what evil home chorus knowst thou it not the home of atreus race take these my words for sooth and ask no more cassandra home cursed of god bear witness unto me ye visioned woes within the blood-stained hands of them that smite their kin the strangling noose and spattered o'er with human blood the reeking floor chorus how like a sleuth-hound questing on the track keen-scented unto blood and death she hies cassandra ah can the ghostly guidance fail whereby my prophet's soul is onwards led look for their flesh the spectre children wail their sodden limbs on which their father fed chorus long since we knew of thy prophetic fame but for those deeds we seek no prophet's tongue cassandra god tis another crime worse than the storied woe of olden time cureless abhorred that one is plotting here a shaming death for those that should be dear alas and far away in foreign land he that should help doth stand chorus i knew the old tales the city rings with all but now thy speech is dark beyond my ken cassandra o oh, wretch o oh, purpose fell thou for thy wedded lord the cleansing wave hast poured a treacherous welcome how the sequel tell too soon twill come too soon for now even now she smites him blow on blow chorus riddles beyond my read i peer in vain through the dim films that screen the prophecy cassandra god a new sight a net a snare of hell set by her hand herself a snare more fell a wedded wife she slays her lord helped by another hand ye powers whose hate of atreus home no blood can satiate raise the wild cry above the sacrifice abhorred chorus why biddest thou some fiend i know not whom shriek o'er the house thine is no cheering word back to my heart in frozen fear i feel my waning life-blood run the blood that round the wounding steel ebbs slow as sinks life's parting sun swift swift and sure some woe comes pressing on 
cassandra away away keep him away the monarch of the herd the pasture's pride far from his mate in treacherous wrath muffling his swarthy horns with secret scathe she gores his fenceless side hark in the brimming bath the heavy plash the dying cry hark in the labour hark he falls by treachery chorus i read amiss dark sayings such as thine yet something warns me that they tell of ill o oh, dark prophetic speech ill tidings dost thou teach ever to mortals here below ever some tale of awe and woe through all thy windings manifold do we unriddle and unfold cassandra ah well a day the cup of agony whereof i chant foams with a draught for me ah lord ah leader thou hast led me here was it but to die with thee whose doom is near chorus distraught thou art divinely stirred and wailest for thyself a tuneless lay as piteous as this ceaseless tale wherewith the brown melodious bird doth ever itis itis wail deep bowered in sorrow all its little lifetime's day cassandra ah for thy fate o shrill-voiced nightingale some solace for thy woes did heaven afford clothe thee with soft brown plumes and life apart from wail but for my death is edged the double biting sword chorus what pangs are these what fruitless pain sent on thee from on high thou chantest terror's frantic strain yet in shrill measured melody how thus unerring canst thou sweep along the prophet's path of boding song cassandra woe paris woe on thee thy bridal joy was death and fire upon thy race and troy and woe for thee scamander's flood beside thy banks o river fair i grew in tender nursing care from childhood unto maidenhood now not by thine but by coquita's stream and acheron's banks shall ring my boding scream chorus too plain is all too plain a child might read aright thy fateful strain deep in my heart their piercing fang terror and sorrow set the while i heard that piteous low tender word yet to mine ear and heart a crushing pang cassandra woe for my city woe for ilion's fall father how oft with sanguine stain streamed on thine altar stone the blood of cattle slain that heaven might guard our wall but all was shed in vain lo lie the shattered towers whereas they fell and i ah burning heart shall soon lie low as well chorus of sorrow is thy song of sorrow still alas what power of ill sits heavy on thy heart and bids thee tell in tears of perfect moan thy deadly tale some woe i know not what must close thy piteous wail cassandra list for no more the presage of my soul bride-like shall peer from its secluding veil but as the morning wind blows clear the east more bright shall blow the wind of prophecy and as against the low bright line of dawn heaves high and higher yet the rolling wave so in the clearing skies of prescience dawns on my soul a further deadlier woe and i will speak but in dark speech no more bear witness ye and follow at my side i sent the trail of blood shed long ago within this house acquire abidingly chants in harsh unison the chant of ill yea and they drink for more in hardened joy man's blood for wine and revel in the halls departing never furies of the home they sit within they chant the primal curse each spitting hatred on that crime of old the brothers couch the love incestuous that brought forth hatred to the ravisher say is my speech o'er wild and erring now or doth its arrow cleave the mark indeed they called me once the prophetess of lies the wandering hag the pest of every door attest ye now she knows in very sooth the house's curse the storied infamy chorus yet how should oath how loyally so e'er i swear it aught avail thee in good sooth my wonder meets thy claim i stand amazed that thou a maiden born beyond the seas 
dost as a native know and tell aright tales of a city of an alien tongue cassandra that is my power a boon apollo gave chorus god though he were yearning for mortal maid cassandra ay what seemed shame of old is shame no more chorus such finer sense suits not with slavery cassandra he strove to win me panting for my love chorus came ye by compact unto bridal joys cassandra nay for i plighted troth then foiled the god chorus wert thou already dowered with prescience cassandra yea prophetess to joy of all her doom chorus how left thee then apollo's wrath unscathed cassandra i false to him seem prophet false to all chorus not so to us at least thy words seem sooth cassandra woe for me woe again the agony dread pain that sees the future all too well with ghastly preludes whirls and racks my soul behold ye yonder in the palace roof the spectre children sitting look such things as dreams are made on phantoms as of babes horrible shadows that a kinsman's hand hath marked with murder and their arms are full a rueful burden see they hold them up the entrails upon which their father fed for this for this i say their plots revenge a coward lion couching in the lair guarding the gate against my master's foot my master mine i bear the slave's yoke now and he the lord of ships who trod down troy knows not the fawning treachery of tongue of this thing false and dog-like how her speech glozes and sleeks her purpose till she win by ill fate's favour the desired chance moving like ate to a secret end o oh, allless soul the woman slays her lord woman what loathsome monster of the earth were fit comparison the double snake or scylla where she dwells the seaman's bane girt round about with rocks some hag of hell raving a truceless curse upon her kin hark even now she cries exultingly the vengeful cry that tells of battle turned how fain forsooth to greet her chief restored nay then believe me not what skills belief or disbelief fate works its will and thou wilt see and say in ruth her tale was true chorus ah tis thyestes feast on kindred flesh i guess her meaning and with horror thrill hearing no shadowed hint of the o'er true tale but its full hatefulness yet for the rest far from the track i roam and know no more cassandra tis agamemnon's doom thou shalt behold chorus peace hapless woman to thy boding words cassandra far from my speech stands he who sains and saves chorus i were such doom at hand which god forbid cassandra thou prayest idly these move swift to slay chorus what man prepares a deed of such despite cassandra fool thus to read amiss mine oracles chorus deviser and device are dark to me cassandra dark all too well i speak the grecian tongue chorus ay but in thine as in apollo's strains familiar is the tongue but dark the thought cassandra ah ah the fire it waxes nears me now woe woe for me apollo of the dawn lo how the woman thing the lioness couched with the wolf her noble mate afar will slay me slave forlorn yea like some witch she drugs the cup of wrath that slays her lord with double death his recompense for me ay tis for me the prey he bore from troy that she hath sworn his death and edged the steel ye wands ye wreaths that cling around my neck ye showed me prophetess yet scorned of all i stamp you into death or ere i die down to destruction thus i stand revenged go crown some other with a prophet's woe look it is he it is apollo's self rending from me the prophet robe he gave god while i wore it yet thou saw'st me mocked there at my home by each malicious mouth to all and each an undivided scorn the name alike in fate of witch and cheat 
woe poverty and famine all i bore and at this last the god hath brought me here unto death's toils and what his love had made his hate unmakes me now and i shall stand not now before the altar of my home but me a slaughter-house and block of blood shall see hewn down a reeking sacrifice yet shall the gods have heed of me who die for by their will shall one requite my doom he to avenge my father's blood outpoured shall smite and slay with matricidal hand ay he shall come though far away he roam a banished wanderer in a stranger's land to crown his kindred's edifice of ill called home to vengeance by his father's fall thus have the high gods sworn and shall fulfil and now why mourn i tarrying on earth since first mine ilion has found its fate and i beheld and those who won the wall pass to such issue as the gods ordain i too will pass and like them dare to die turns and looks upon the palace door portal of hades thus i bid thee hail grant me one boon a swift and mortal stroke that all unwrung by pain with ebbing blood shed forth in quiet death i close mine eyes chorus made of mysterious woes mysterious lore long was thy prophecy but if aright thou readest all thy fate how thus unscared dost thou approach the altar of thy doom as fronts the knife some victim heaven controlled cassandra friends there is no avoidance in delay chorus yet who delays the longest his the gain cassandra the day is come flight were small gain to me chorus o oh, brave endurance of a soul resolved cassandra that were ill praise for those of happier doom chorus all fame is happy even famous death cassandra ah sire ah brethren famous once were ye she moves to enter the house then starts back chorus what fear is this that scares thee from the house cassandra pa chorus what is this cry some dark despair of soul cassandra pa the house fumes with stench and spilth of blood chorus how tis the smell of household offerings cassandra tis rank as charnel scent from open graves chorus thou canst not mean this scented syrian nard cassandra nay let me pass within to cry aloud the monarch's fate and mine enough of life ah friends bear to me witness since i fall in death that not as birds that shun the bush and scream i moan in idle terror this attests when for my death's revenge another dies a woman for a woman and a man falls for a man ill wedded to his curse grant me this boon the last before i die chorus brave to the last i mourn thy doom foreseen cassandra once more one utterance but not of wail though for my death and then i speak no more son thou whose beam i shall not see again to thee i cry let those whom vengeance calls to slay their kindred slayers quit withal the death of me the slave the fenceless prey ah state of mortal man in time of weal a line a shadow and if ill fate fall one wet sponge sweep wipes all our trace away and this i deem less piteous of the twain exit into the palace end of part three recording by expatriate in bangor maine Part four of Agamemnon by Aeschylus, translated by Edmund Doidge Anderson Morshead, eighteen forty nine to nineteen twelve. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Part four. Chorus. Too true it is, our mortal state with blisses never satiate, and none before the palace high and stately of prosperity cries to us with a voice of fear away tis ill to enter here lo this our lord hath trodden down by grace of heaven old priam's town 
and praised as god he stands once more on argos shore yet now if blood shed long ago cries out that other blood shall flow his life-blood his to pay again the stern requital of the slain peace to that braggart's vaunting vein who having heard the chieftain's tale yet boasts of bliss untouched by bale a loud cry from within voice of agamemnon oh i am sped a deep a mortal blow chorus listen listen who is screaming as in mortal agony voice of agamemnon oh oh again another another blow chorus the bloody act is over i have heard the monarch's cry let us swiftly take some counsel lest we too be doomed to die one of the chorus tis best i judge allowed for aid to call ho loyal argives to the palace all another better i deem ourselves to bear the aid and drag the deed to light while drips the blade another such will is mine and what thou sayst i say swiftly to act the time brooks no delay another ay for tis plain this prelude of their song foretells its close in tyranny and wrong another behold we tarry but thy name delay they spurn and press with sleepless hand to slay another i know not what twere well to counsel now who wills to act tis his to counsel how another thy doubt is mine for when a man is slain i have no words to bring his life again another what e'en for life's sake bow us to obey these house defilers and their tyrant's sway another unmanly doom twere better far to die death is a gentler lord than tyranny another think well must cry or sign of woe or pain fix our conclusion that the chief is slain another such talk befits us when the deed we see conjecture dwells afar from certainty leader of the chorus i read one will from many a diverse word to know aright how stands it with our lord the scene opens disclosing clytemnestra who comes forward the body of agamemnon lies muffled in a long robe within a silver-sided labor the corpse of cassandra is laid beside him clytemnestra ho ye who heard me speak so long and oft the glozing word that led me to my will hear how i shrink not to unsay it all how else should one who willeth to requite evil for evil to an enemy disguised as friend weave the mesh straightly round him not to be overleaped a net of doom this is the sum and issue of old strife of me deep pondered and at length fulfilled all is avowed and as i smote i stand with foot set firm upon a finished thing i turn not to denial thus i wrought so that he could nor flee nor ward his doom even as the trammel hems the scaly shoal i trapped him with inextricable toils the ill abundance of a baffling robe then smote him once again and at each wound he cried aloud then as in death relaxed each limb and sank to earth and as he lay once more i smote him with the last third blow sacred to hades saviour of the dead and thus he fell and as he passed away spirit with body chafed each dying breath flung from his breast swift bubbling jets of gore and the dark sprinklings of the rain of blood fell upon me and i was fain to feel that dew not sweeter is the rain of heaven to cornland when the green sheath teems with grain elders of argos since the thing stands so i bid you to rejoice if such your will rejoice or not i vaunt and praise the deed and well i ween if seemly it could be twere not ill done to pour libations here justly i more than justly on his corpse who filled his home with curses as with wine and thus returned to drain the cup he filled chorus i marvel at thy tongue's audacity to vaunt thus loudly o'er a husband slain clytemnestra ye hold me as a woman weak of will and strive to sway me but my heart is stout nor fears to speak its uttermost to you albeit ye know its message praise or blame even as ye list i reck not of your words lo 
at my feet lies agamemnon slain my husband once and him this hand of mine a right contriver fashioned for his death behold the deed chorus woman what deadly birth what venomed essence of the earth or dark distilment of the wave to thee such passion gave nerving thine hand to set upon thy brow this burning crown the curses of thy land our king by thee cut off hewn down go forth they cry accursed and forlorn to hate and scorn clytemnestra o ye just men who speak my sentence now the city's hate the ban of all my realm ye had no voice of old to launch such doom on him my husband when he held as light my daughter's life as that of sheep or goat one victim from the thronging fleecy fold yea slew in sacrifice his child and mine the well-loved issue of my travail pangs to lull and lay the gales that blew from thrace that deed of his i say that stain and shame had rightly been atoned by banishment but ye who then were dumb are stern to judge this deed of mine that doth affront your ears storm out your threats yet knowing this forsooth that i am ready if your hand prevail as mine now doth to bow beneath your sway if god say nay it shall be yours to learn by chastisement a late humility chorus bold is thy craft and proud thy confidence thy vaunting loud thy soul that chose a murderous fate is all with blood elate maddened to know the blood not yet avenged the damned spot crimson upon thy brow but fate prepares for thee thy lot smitten as thou didst smite without a friend to meet thine end clytemnestra hear then the sanction of the oath i swear by the great vengeance for my murdered child by ate by the fury unto whom this man lies sacrificed by hand of mine i do not look to tread the hall of fear while in this hearth and home of mine there burns the light of love i guess thus as of old loyal a stalwart shield of confidence as true to me as this slain man was false wronging his wife with paramours at troy fresh from the kiss of each chryseis there behold him dead behold his captive prize seeress and harlot comfort of his bed true prophetess true paramour i wot the sea bench was not closer to the flesh full oft of every rower than was she see ill they did and ill requites them now his death ye know she as a dying swan sang her last dirge and lies as erst she lay close to his side and to my couch has left a sweet new taste of joys that know no fear chorus ah woe and well a day i would that fate not bearing agony too great nor stretching me too long on couch of pain would bid mine eyelids keep the morningless and unawakening sleep for life is weary now my lord is slain the gracious among kings hard fate of old he bore and many grievous things and for a woman's sake on ilian land now is his life hewn down and by a woman's hand o helen o infatuate soul who bades the tides of battle roll o'erwhelming thousands life on life neath ilian's wall and now lies dead the lord of all the blossom of thy storied sin bears blood's inexpiable stain o oh, thou that erst these holes within wert unto all a rock of strife a husband's bane clytemnestra peace pray not thou for death as though thine heart was whelmed beneath this woe nor turn thy wrath aside to ban the name of helen nor recall how she one bane of many a man sent down to death the danaean lords to sleep at troy the sleep of swords and wrought the woe that shattered all chorus fiend of the race that swoopest fell upon the double stock of tantalus lording it o'er me by a woman's will stern manful and imperious a bitter sway to me thy very form i see like some grim raven perched upon the slain exulting o'er the crime aloud in tuneless strain clytemnestra right was that word 
thou namest well the brooding race fiend triply fell from him it is that murder's thirst blood lapping inwardly is nursed ere time the ancient scar can sain new blood comes welling forth again chorus grim is his wrath and heavy on our home that fiend of whom thy voice is cried alas an omen cry of woe unsatisfied an all devouring doom ah woe ah zeus from zeus all things befall zeus the high cause and finisher of all lord of our mortal state by him are willed all things by him fulfilled yet ah my king my king no more what words to say what tears to pour can tell my love for thee the spider web of treachery she wove and wound thy life around and lo i see thee lie and through a coward impious wound pant forth thy life and die a death of shame ah oh, woe on woe a treacherous hand a cleaving blow clytemnestra my guilt thou harpest o'er and o'er i bid thee reckon me no more as agamemnon's spouse the old avenger stern of mood for atreus in his feast of blood hath struck the lord of atreus house and in the semblance of his wife the king hath slain yea for the murdered children's life a chieftain's in requital tain chorus thou guiltless of this murder thou who dares such thought avow yet it may be wroth for the parent's deed the fiend hath holpen thee to slay the son dark ares god of death is pressing on through streams of blood by kindred shed exacting the account for children dead for clotted blood for flesh on which their sire did feed yet ah my king my king no more what words to say what tears to pour can tell my love for thee the spider web of treachery she wove and wound thy life around and lo i see thee lie and through a coward impious wound pant forth thy life and die a death of shame ah woe on woe a treacherous hand a cleaving blow clytemnestra i deem not that the death he died had overmuch of shame for this was he who did provide foul wrong unto his house and name his daughter blossom of my womb he gave unto a deadly doom iphigenia child of tears and as he wrought even so he fares nor be his vaunt too loud in hell for by the sword his sin he wrought and by the sword himself is brought among the dead to dwell chorus ah whither shall i fly for all in ruin sinks the kingly hall nor swift device nor shift of thought have i to scape its fall a little while the gentler raindrops fail i stand distraught a ghastly interval till on the roof-tree rings the bursting hail of blood and doom even now fate wets the steel on whetstones new and deadlier than of old the steel that smites injustice hold another death to deal o earth that i had lain at rest and lapped for ever at thy breast ere i had seen my chieftain fall within the laver's silver wall low lying on dishonoured bier and who shall give him sepulchre and who the wail of sorrow pour woman tis thy no more a graceless gift unto his shade such tribute by his murderess paid strive not thus wrongly to atone the impious deed thy hand hath done ah who above the godlike chief shall weep the tears of loyal grief who speak above his lowly grave the last sad praises of the brave clytemnestra peace for such task is none of thine by me he fell by me he died and now his burial rites be mine yet from these halls no mourner's train shall celebrate his obsequies only by acheron's rolling tide his child shall spring unto his side and in a daughter's loving wise shall clasp and kiss him once again chorus lo sin by sin and sorrow dog by sorrow and who the end can know the slayer of to-day shall die to-morrow the wage of wrong is woe while time shall be while zeus in heaven is lord his law is fixed and stern on him that wrought shall vengeance be outpoured the tides of doom return the children of the curse abide within these halls of high estate and none can wrench from off the home of sin 
the clinging grasp of fate clytemnestra now walks thy word aright to tell this ancient truth of oracle but i with vows of sooth will pray to him the power that holdeth sway o'er all the race of pleisthenes though dark the deed and deep the guilt with this last blood my hands have spilt i pray thee let thine anger cease i pray thee pass from us away to some new race in other lands there if thou wilt to wrong and slay the lives of men by kindred hands for me tis all sufficient meed though little wealth or power were won so i can say tis past and done the bloody lust and murderous the inborn frenzy of our house is ended by my deed enter aegisthus aegisthus dawn of the day of rightful vengeance hail i dare at length aver that gods above have care of men and heed of earthly wrongs i i who stand and thus exult to see this man lie wound in robes the furies wove slain in requital of his father's craft take ye the truth that atreus this man's sire the lord and monarch of this land of old held with my sire thyestes deep dispute brother with brother for the prize of sway and drave him from his home to banishment thereafter the lorn exile homeward stole and clung a suppliant to the hearth divine and for himself won this immunity not with his own blood to defile the land that gave him birth but atreus godless sire of him who here lies dead this welcome plan with zeal that was not love he feigned to hold in loyal joy a day of festal cheer and bade my father to his board and set before him flesh that was his children once first sitting at the upper board alone he hid the fingers and the feet but gave the rest and readily thyestes took what to his ignorance no semblance wore of human flesh and ate behold what curse that eating brought upon our race and name for when he knew what all unhallowed thing he thus had wrought with horror's bitter cry back starting spewing forth the fragments foul on pelops house a deadly curse he spake as darkly as i spurn this damned food so perish all the race of pleisthenes thus by that curse fell he whom here ye see and i who else this murder wove and planned for me an infant yet in swaddling bands of the three children youngest atreus sent to banishment by my sad father's side but justice brought me home once more grown now to manhood's years and stranger though i was my right hand reached unto the chieftain's life plotting and planning all that malice bade and death itself were honour now to me beholding him in justice ambushed tain chorus i guess thus for this insolence of thine that vaunts itself in evil take my scorn of thine own will thou sayest thou hast slain the chieftain by thine own unaided plot devise the piteous death i read thee well think not thy head shall scape when right prevails the people's ban the stones of death and doom i guess thus this word from thee this word from one who rose low at the oars beneath what time we rule we of the upper tier thou know anon tis better to be taught again in age by one so young submission at the word but iron of the chain and hunger's throes can minister unto an o'er-swoln pride marvellous well ay even in the old hast eyes and seest not this peace kick not thus against the pricks unto thy proper pain chorus thou womanish man waiting till war did cease home watcher and defiler of the couch and arch deviser of the chieftain's doom i guess thus bold words again but they shall end in tears the very converse thine of orpheus tongue he roused and led in ecstasy of joy all things that heard his voice melodious but thou as with the futile cry of curs will draw men wrathfully upon thee peace or strong subjection soon shall tame thy tongue chorus ay thou art one to hold an argive down thou skilled to plan the murder of the king but not with thine own hand to smite the blow i guess thus that fraudful force was woman's very part not mine whom deep suspicion from of old would have debarred now by his treasure's aid my purpose holds to rule the citizens 
but whoso will not bear my guiding hand him for his corn-fed metal i will drive not as a trace-horse light caparisoned but to the shafts with heaviest harness bound famine the grim mate of the dungeon dark shall look on him and shall behold him tamed chorus thou losel soul was then thy strength too slight to deal in murder while a woman's hand staining and shaming argos and its gods availed to slay him no if anywhere the light of life smite on orestes eyes let him returning by some guardian fate hew down with force her paramour and her aegisthus how thy word and act shall issue thou shalt shortly understand chorus up to action o my comrades for the fight is hard at hand swift your right hands to the sword hilt bear the weapon as for strife aegisthus lo i too am standing ready hand on hilt for death or life chorus twas thy word and we accept it onward to the chance of war clytemnestra nay enough enough my champion we will smite and slay no more already have we reaped enough the harvest field of guilt enough of wrong and murder let no other blood be spilt peace old men and pass away unto the homes by fate decreed lest ill valour meet our vengeance twas a necessary deed but enough of toils and troubles be the end if ever now ere thy talon o avenger deal another deadly blow tis a woman's word of warning and let who will list thereto i guess thus but that these should loose and lavish reckless blossoms of the tongue and in hazard of their fortune cast upon me words of wrong and forget the law of subjects and revile their ruler's word chorus ruler but tis not for argives thus to own a dastard lord i guess thus i will follow to chastise thee in my coming days of sway chorus not if fortune guide orestes safely on his homeward way i guess thus ah well i know how exiles feed on hopes of their return chorus fair and batten on pollution of the right while tis thy turn i guess thus thou shalt pay be well assured heavy quittance for thy pride chorus crow and strut with her to watch thee like a cock his mate beside clytemnestra heed not thou too highly of them let the cur pack growl and yell i and thou will rule the palace and will order all things well exeunt end of part four recording by expatriate in bangor maine end of agamemnon by aeschylus translated by edmund doidge anderson morshead eighteen forty nine to nineteen twelve